You're inside the Mom Stuff Coffee Shop, a podcast dedicated to helping you get back up again, turning your pain into power, turning your trauma into triumph. I am your host, KK Smith, and I find joy in helping you get back up again. This podcast holds a space for you to grow, heal, and connect like you never have before. So grab your coffee and step inside the Mom Stuff Coffee Shop. Welcome to today's show. Today we're joined by Orshika Yulia, the founder of Out of the Quicksand, a program specifically for parents that have overcome domestic violence. We are so excited to have her on the show. So welcome, Orshika. Thank you so much, KK. I'm ecstatic to be here and to speak to your audience and just to get to know you a little bit. Thank you. So can you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. So I am a daughter and sister to Hungarian refugees. So my parents and siblings came over to the U.S. to give us a better life. And that's the very, very beginning. And then I grew up in a you know middle class home and life was good. I had a very solid home foundation and loving family. And then I got married young-ish, got divorced from my daughter's father. That was a fine relationship. I think we were just young, both of us, right? We both had a lot of growing up to do. And then I met my son's father, who was the abuser. And, you know, if I had to summarize it, I think it was all because of low self-esteem is how I got into that relationship. So now I've been free or we've been free as a family for nine and a half years. And so now I have gone through Jack Canfield's Train the Trainer program so that I have a really good solid foundation on the success principles and how I can implement those in my business to help parents of domestic violence, you know, who have survived domestic violence, be able to successfully parent and live life. And so then I started my business called Out of the Quicksand because I heard the calling, you know, I, I prayed and I meditated and there was just such a very distinct mission put on my heart and so that's what i'm doing now is following my mission so that's such a powerful mission so can you tell us how do you help parents to help their children oh well sure absolutely (laughs) so specifically you know the first and foremost important thing when we're out of that domestic violence situation and congratulations to each and every one of you who are out It's just so important to remember to serve from your overflow. Lisa Nichols talks about this all the time. She's a transformational speaker. She talks about it all the time that we need to serve from our overflow. And I didn't get that at first. And so this is something that I implement with my clients that we've got to do the self-care first. We've got to take care of ourselves first before we take care of our children. So serving from your overflow, just to explain that a little, pretend you're a saucer and your saucer when it's empty you have nothing to give right so you have to fill it up and you fill it fill it and fill it and when you get to the brim of the saucer then everything that leaks over is what you now have an excess to give to others so serving from your overflow is so critical and so important so that you can be whole before you give to your children and that's that's paramount right because when you give from nothing you give nothing so talk about the prototype that parents are subliminally giving their children when they stay in domestic violence relationships. Oh, that's another wonderful question. KK, you're full of them this morning. (laughs) (laughs) Full of the good questions. So subliminally, you know, obviously there's one of two paths that most children will take. One, they'll be the abuser or two, they'll be the abused. Neither option is healthy. Neither option is good. This is definitely a cycle that absolutely needs to be stopped. It's the same with alcoholism. It's the same with drug use. I'm not saying that abuse is an addiction, but maybe for some people it is. It's a learned behavior, right? And it's paramount to stop that. And so when you get out of an abusive situation, it's relevant and so very important to teach your children, one, it's not okay to be either side of those, right? The abuser's behavior should not be accepted should not be condoned as, oh, he was having a rough day or, oh, she was stressed at work or whatever the case may be, because abuse does go both ways, right? It's not just men abusing women. It's the opposite way as well. Women do abuse their husbands and their partners. So yeah, it's just, it's important to teach the children that neither side is acceptable. And also, I think that 
when we stay in abusive relationships, not only do the children see physical abuse, but they're also accepting psychological abuse and manipulation because 100%. it looks like we're a happy family and you know, mom gets abused and we go on a vacation and now it's a manipulation psychologically. So what type of effects can this have on children as they're becoming adults, young adults in relationships? What would you tell parents of young women psychologically if they're being abused, how can they separate that and help their young daughter that's dating. Yeah, absolutely. And that's such a valid question. I do have two now older daughters. They're 21 and 19. So they're, you know, one's living with somebody and the other one is married to somebody. So it's really, really important to talk to your daughters and let them know once you're out that the behavior behavior that you accepted from the person with whom you were living is unacceptable. And you did it because whatever your reasons are, sometimes we need to dig deep and, and say, you know, I did it because of low self-esteem. I did it because whatever the case is, generally speaking, the baseline is low self-esteem. We accept way more than we ought to when our self-esteem is, you know, substandard. But it's so important to talk to the daughters, to your daughters, and tell them that this is not acceptable and this is why it's not acceptable. You know, we should choose to treat each other as kind humans and any sort of violence, verbal, physical, emotional, mental, it's its not okay. Yes. It's just now, not okay. You mentioned coming from a good home. Did you ever okay where your low self-esteem came from? Was it an onset from the relationship or was it something that happened before the relationship? Could you talk about how do we come from strong foundations and we could still develop low self-esteem because my background, why I started this podcast, because I was abused as a child and I made a lot of wrong turns because of low self-esteem in life. But as I'm interviewing guests, I'm finding that a lot of guests have a strong foundation. So can you talk about how can you slip into low self-esteem, even coming from healthy parents and strong foundations? Sure, absolutely. So mine was 100% because I was divorced, young, and had two small children. And in my mind's eye, I was used goods. Culturally, that's the environment I was raised in. And that sounds horrible. I don't know how to explain it better. It, it was a cultural thing. It wasn't implemented by my family specifically. Right. It was just a cultural thing, right? That we don't get divorced. And if you do, then, you know, what are you? You're just used goods. And so my low self-esteem came from that was like, now what do I do? Here I am at 28, divorced with two small children. They were one and three when I left. And nobody's going to love me and I'm not worthy of love. And I've broken up our family and this is not the way we're supposed to be. And how could I have chosen a spouse that I wasn't going to stick around with? And, you know, all of those, all of those mental anguishing decisions, right? Mentally anguishing decisions. They just, they weighed very heavily on me. And I just kept beating myself up and beating myself up and like, you're worthless and, and nobody's going to love you and you're going to amount to nothing. And they were all lies brought on by the devil. They were all lies. <laughs> That's all there is to it. Yeah. Now, can you speak to women who might be single and who might be thinking the same thing? Because whether women are in abusive relationships or whether they're single for a long time. A lot of women seem to have their self-worth wrapped up in two. Am I single? Am I going to get somebody? How long I've been single? So can you speak to women about being okay with being single so that you can get your your internal space correct? Like your you self-care. Know and then build from that foundation of wholeness instead of absolutely absolutely so this is a huge huge passion for me because i understand and i see that culturally and i lived it too so it's not even like i'm sitting on the sidelines watching this football game you know i'm actually in it and getting hit and when i left the abuser i was working at a church and one of my coworkers lovered to pieces and she's like 
so when are you going to start dating? And I was like, why do I need a man to fulfill me as a human? Or why do I need a woman to fulfill me as a human? You know, whatever gender, right? We're specifically speaking the female leading today, you know, but there it is. It's such a cultural thing. Like we are identified by whether or not we're in a relationship. And if we're single, then one, there must be something wrong with us or two, you know, she must be so hurt that she's never going to love again. And again, all of those are lies. Nothing's wrong with you. You're not so hurt that you're never going to be in a relationship again. It's important to heal internally and be your whole self so that you can, when the time comes, if you so choose for when the time to come, when you do want to give yourself to somebody, your whole self to somebody, not your broken pieces. You can put Humpty Dumpty back together again. You know, it just takes time. It takes love. It takes patience. It takes energy you're not gonna put yourself whole again in two weeks when you've been quote-unquote broken for 10 years yeah you've got to give yourself that time and patience and grace lots of forgiveness right to to become whole so that you can give your entire self and that includes to your children too yes and i'm finding that like with empathic people people that really care from their heart They can forget about self-love and self-worth. And all of your life, you're just giving, giving, giving. And then when that that sort of structure disappears where it's a man there, you feel like there's nothing left that you're not there. And that's what I like to concentrate with women on is telling women you're still there. No matter what structure leaves, you're still there. So that's really important. So, and it's almost like you're better there. Yeah. You know, like I have, I've found that like standing on my own two feet feels so much more empowering, so much more peaceful, so much more whole than depending on somebody else to fill my void. That's a horrible thing to do to another human being. Let's just back up for a second here. Sorry, I'm going to get in my soapbox, but let's just back up and like to put that pressure on another human being that your happiness is dependent on their existence in your life. They didn't ask for that pressure. Take it off of them. It's not fair. How would you feel if somebody put that pressure on you? Oh, I can only be happy with you. Oh, hello. Welcome back to narcissism. Welcome back to abuse. Why would you do that to somebody else? Right. And I call that borrowing strength. So we borrow strength in the moment. I can remember when I used to go out and speak and my sister, I would always tell my sister, come with me, you know, because my sister has this bold personality. She's built programs. Uh, She's a nurse, but she's a strong personality. And I will always want her with me. And I would be like, can you speak first? Can you do that? And I thought about it and I said, you're borrowing, you're actually taking her strength. You have to stand on your own two feet with whatever you want to do in life, whether you're escaping a bad relationship, a friendship, you're building a a project, your passion project, you're going to have to stand on your own two feet. And like you said, that is so much power. I began to have so much more power when I realized what I was doing. I was yes. doing and borrowing her strength. Yes. So yes. I think women, we do that, like you say, societal expectations where, okay, do you have to be in a relationship? Do you have to drive this car? Do you have to live here? Do you have to do that career that you absolutely hate? Oh, right, right. Now I'm strong. I'm okay now because I'm doing that. But you could be so unhappy on the inside. Right. Yeah. Right. Yes. All the yeses. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So out of the quicksand, so is that an online program or do you meet in person? Do you go around? Can you talk about what's the structure and how specifically you help and what programs you offer within that program? Yeah, absolutely. So I have a six week program, a three month program, and then one on one coaching. And so I am basically your transformational guide through all three of the programs. So the six week program is just getting you out of the quicksand, right? Like you're, you're getting out of your quicksand and it's ideally for the parents who have been out of the abuse, but they're still stuck in their quicksand. Does that make sense? Yes. Like they're out of the abuse and I know where my strengths are and it is helping people find 
their way out of the quicksand. I mean, I, I know I keep repeating it, but I mean, that's why my business is named out of the quicksand. That is where my strength is. There are so many organizations and helping hands to help people physically get out of abuse. But my specialty is helping people find themselves after the abuse, right? Like I've left it behind. I'm not going back because oftentimes abused mothers and fathers will go back because it's a safety thing. It's a safety net. So they're like, oh, I just rather sit in my own crud because I know I'm safe, quote unquote, safe there. Right. So my specialty is once you're done with it, like done, done. Right. And then the three month program is just delving deeper into finding your passion and finding your purpose. And then of course the one-on-one -on -one coaching is <laughs> it's a really intimate program for sure. Cause you get me and I, I just, I love what I do. And you get me in all three programs. Honestly, you get me. It's live, like like Zoom live. And when the world goes back to however our new norm is, then we'll, we'll adjust and pivot to whatever that offers. That's awesome. And I absolutely love your niche that, you know, I was on a call with some entrepreneurs developing some different ventures. And we were talking about niching. And... You don't realize when you get really specific, that's who you're meant to serve. Absolutely. You know, that's where your passion is. And so many times when we're developing anything, we're trying to go so broad and big, right. but that's not the specific audience that we need to serve based on what we've been through and based on what we can help people passionately with. Absolutely. There's the broad things and there's the thing that you've gone through and you can actually show someone, like you said, how do you get out of the quicksand? And now that you're out, okay, now, and I absolutely love that you're able to help clients with that. So can you actually tell us some success stories? I know you can't mention names, but sure. where have you taken clients from point A to point C? Yeah, of course I can. And I'd be happy to. I had one specific client that she is a single mom and her son is just a little bit younger than mine and she just was stuck in her muck stuck in her quicksand and we spent about six months together and through our time together she is such a different person now she has more confidence can make decisions more easily she understands that the gentleman with whom she was partially involved at the time was not healthy for her. And that's not because I was like, oh my gosh, he's not good for you. Like you need to come to that on your own. If you're going to accept certain behaviors, that's on you, right? Just like same with me in my personal life. So she metamorphosized from this, like, oh, I just don't know what I'm going to do with my life. And I'm not sure if I'm making the right decisions for my son to this confident woman who's just embracing life and stepping into the world, into what she's meant to do and she's a nurse by trade but now she's exploring all these wonderful other avenues and it's for me seeing that confidence build one in women right but two as a as a parent is just like yes like that's yes you know just it excites me so much because then her son sees that one mom is a strong woman and she's gonna you know absolutely defend me everywhere in life. But two, this is what a strong woman looks like. This is what I would hope that he's going to be attracted to later in life versus like a meek woman. And he just has such a soft heart and he will definitely not continue the pattern. He will stop the pattern because she decided that she was going to go through this training and she decided that she wants a better life for herself and for her son. Yes. And I think that's so important that children see resilience in parents and also like you talked a lot about strength because that is what's in the baton because yes. we don't know the lessons that we're giving our children subliminally with just looking at our lives is mom going to fall all apart here is she going to get back up again is she going to be strong like you say and you could pass that baton and that's the up close look for a child because in life things do go wrong you know things absolutely a white picket fence 1.2 children things do go wrong and i think it's so important that children see the great comebacks in life because that is a part of their baton so i think that's it is. awesome that's awesome that you're doing you. this work you. so is there anything that you want to share with our guests 
that we might not have known? And did you want to talk a little bit about your own relationship? Like, if you're comfortable enough, how did <laughs> you start to recognize the narcissistic behavior? And can you explain narcissism to our listeners? Absolutely. So this is kind of funny. My cat urinated on his clothes. Big red flag. If your cat doesn't urinate on anybody else's clothes, but the person who's coming into your life, <laughs> listen oh. to your animals, people. <laughs> like Just listen. To, <laughs> that's what I got for you today. Listen to your animals. But no, the narcissistic behavior was like, you know, now looking back, of course, being in it, I didn't realize it because I've never really dealt with narcissism until that point. So it took me a while to be like, Oh, oh, you're really a jerk. You know, he'd buy me flowers and make breakfast because he worked third shift and moved in really quickly because narcissists like to be in absolute control. And he said he had just gotten out of another relationship and was living with his parents. And I allowed him to move in pretty darn quickly, which was a, another big red flag. And when your mother warns you, ladies, just listen. She has the wisdom and experience and don't try to just stick your heels in the dirt, and prove her wrong, just to prove her wrong. It ain't worth it. So the controlling, you know, narcissists tend to be highly controlling and he was very controlling. So I would go to a friend's house and he would show up, you know, just to make sure that I'm there. I'm like, well, if I said I'm going to be here, then I'm going to be here. Like, why would I not be? Well, in his mind's eye, I wouldn't be because he wasn't where he said he was going to be. So, you know, the little things like if you're not answering your phone for 24 hours, he might not be where he's supposed to be. You know, he might be partaking in extracurricular activities with a 19 year old, mm. you know, that kind of behavior. Mm. Narcissists also blame you, the victim, quote unquote victim, for everything wrong in their life. I can't pay bills because you didn't handle the budget right. I don't get to go out because you're too demanding. You don't wear sexy enough clothes, so I'm not going to take you out. Why aren't you wearing makeup when you're gardening? I'm gardening in the South. Why would I wear makeup? Why, why would I wear makeup gardening in the North? You know, like I'm gardening. They tell you what to wear. They tell you where to go. They tell you how to talk to people. They want access to your phone, but you don't have access to their phone. I mean, these are all very basic, tried and true narcissistic characteristics and behaviors. You get accused of like partaking in extracurricular activities with people when you're like, I literally was just at lunch with my friend that I've known for way longer than I knew you. And we were in public and we were sitting by the window and I invited your friends to come sit with us. <laughs> and all of a sudden, you know, there's the accusations of like, well, you were doing some stuff with that person. Yeah, I was eating an Arby's sandwich. That's the stuff I was doing. So <laughs> narcissists will accuse, 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 accuse time and again. That's not okay, people. It's just not okay. Now, when did the abuse start? There's the behavior and then there's the physical abuse. When, how well, into the relationship did that start? Yeah, so realistically, like the mental and emotional abuse started pretty early on. And once the physical started, I was out. I was like, no, mm -hmm. if you're willing to rape me, what are you gonna do with my daughters? Mm. Not okay because they were coming of age. So, no. So I left as soon as the physical started. How old were they? Well, I guess 11 and nine, because it's been about 10 years, they're 21 and 19. Yeah, that's the kind of math we do. <laughs> yeah, they, so they were 11 and... <laughs> they, at any point, tell you that they, okay, mom, why is he doing this? Or, you know, I saw him do this and, and you kind of covered it up or you talked to them about, okay, this is, the, you did see what you saw, but this is what I'm going to do about it. Um, he was very good at not doing things in front of the kids. There was one time that he did, and I just told the kids to go to the kitchen, and I was going to be right there. So I covered up. I did. I covered up. And then when his behaviors were less than stellar towards my children, I did make excuses. Yep. I'll admit it. I, you know, we're not perfect. I flawed. And then on the other side of that coin, when he threatened my children, then I threatened him. So I definitely, you know, Mama Bear came out. I was like, no, because no. I tend to protect everybody to a fault. Sometimes, you know, you don't need to protect a narcissist. You don't need to protect the abuser, but that's just who I am. And I tend to 
look deep, deep, deep inside to people's goodness. And to this day, I know that that man has goodness in him. He's just choosing to let the other out. And that's his choice. And my choice is to not be in a relationship with him. Right. Now, how is the relationship with his child and him? Is he able to have a relationship with his child? Non-existent. Yeah. Over the past 10 years, there's been three protective orders and it's non-existent. He's not willing to, and this isn't finger pointing, this is factual, right? Because I, I could throw shade and slander, but that's just not right. And that's not teaching anybody anything. So side note, get away from this, just the shade and slander throwing people. It's not going to do anything, but he didn't follow the judge's requests. So he doesn't have any access okay. at the moment. Yeah. And my son's old enough now to make the decision for himself. And we've talked about that and decisions have been made. So no access. Okay. Now during this time when you were on your exit from the relationship, did you have a support system, a community, a best friend, people that helped you, walked you through this process? Yes, absolutely who came and helped me pack up our belongings and I had friends who allowed me to stay a few towns over so that he didn't realize that we were leaving because we literally escaped like he was at work we packed up the house and we left with whatever fit into a U-Haul in a truck and I went to family who was very supportive so I definitely am very very blessed in the way that I have a wonderful support group and with that being said that doesn't mean you know, Pollyanna and great and sunshine and smiles, of course. Thankfully, my support group does not understand getting out of abuse. They're there to love me, but they didn't understand the mental anguish, the emotional burden of all, of everything that's involved, especially as a parent. So even though I had the support and the love, I felt lacking in the understanding. And it's so important for survivors of abuse to realize that they're not alone. I felt very, very lonely, even though I had the love and the support because I wasn't able to talk to anybody about what's going on mentally. The transparency. Yeah. And sometimes mm -hmm. when you're talking about something that other people aren't going through and they are your friends and loved ones, they can, you will know that personality is going to shame me. That personality is going to tell me I'm crazy for doing this, that person. So it's like you're trapped in this cycle where you're saying, oh, I can't talk to her. I can't talk to her. I can't talk to her. Yeah. And you're actually a part of a group, but you're actually alone. Mm -hmm. That's right. And there wasn't, thankfully, like with my support group, genuinely, my support group loves me unconditionally to this day. Like they, there wasn't that shame involved from them. It was involved from me to the world. I felt so much shame, but that, that is so true that there are people that you look at and you're like, oh, she's going to judge me or he's going to judge me or he's going <laughs> to yeah. love me less or, you know, and think about whether or not you really want those people in your life. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I want you to just briefly tell people that might be in abusive relationships because it's ironic the other day, you know, we're doing this interview today, but I read an article, it was so sad, it was about a mother who had two children and one child from her husband, and she decided to leave. And, you know, she posted something on Facebook, and then he posted something, and the next day he killed her, her two oh. children, and took his child. And, you know, his child was safe. So sometimes there is extreme circumstances about that. Yes. So can you talk to our listeners, anybody that's very scared and perplexed and, and they're at that moment where they're so scared to leave because they don't know who this person really is and what they're capable of. What are some tips that you would give people to leave and make a clean, exit strategy okay if you all haven't been listening or you've been in and out of this podcast kind of cleaning or jogging or whatever right now is the time to truly listen in because this is a major major important question that kk just asked so she asked what are some tips to make sure that you get out safely 
and what are the strategies? Okay, listeners, are you with us? Here we go. Make sure that you talk to authority before you leave. Go to them, put your personal anything aside for just a moment here, because some people feel very passionate about authority in today's society. Put it aside and understand that they will help you when they see that you're serious, right? Go to them calmly and rationally. I am leaving on this day. This is the address I'm going to, and this is the phone number where you can reach me. I would like to write a statement of what happened, and I will do that as soon as whatever, give them a date by Monday, if you're leaving on a Friday or Saturday or whatever, or whatever you feel comfortable with. So it is very, very important to let the authorities know your exit strategy, because if you do not, then the abuser will say she kidnapped my children. So I went to the authorities and I said, this is what happened. This is where I'm going. And they said, get yourself to safety and write us a statement as soon as you can. So absolutely authority is there to help. So if you don't trust your local authority, like the local police, then go to the sheriffs, right? And if you don't trust that, then go to the state troopers. But let authority know what's going on. However, if you're in a situation where you need to get out now, get out and call the authority as you're getting out, right? Let them know, I had to leave the situation immediately. I have my children with me. This is what happened. What do you recommend? And listen to them. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. And also, are there programs that we might not know about, such as CASA, programs that you can go to and they will absolutely hide you, per se? Like, sure. you, incognito, you could go there with your children and sure. totally safe like, sure. and not look back. Yeah. So what are some of those programs? Well, <laughs> it's their secret. You kind of have to, again, you have to depend on the authority because they don't advertise that, right? Okay. So it's different for each location. I lived in a different state when we first left than I do now. And I know that where there was group counseling there, there was a safe house. Okay. So there are safe houses in, I would say, just about every town. And if you call 911, they will be able to help you. If you're like literally running away from somebody, you know, abusing you with a hammer and grabbing your kids, get in the car, call 911, tell them what's going on. You shouldn't even be listening to the, this podcast if that's what's going on. But that's, that's a whole other story. But yeah, 911 will be able to help you. The authorities will be able to help you. They'll at least be able to point you in the right direction and say, you know, there's group counseling with this county. Call them and they'll be able to help you. So do the work. It's going to be hard work, but it might be a few phone calls. But that's better than the alternative, right? Because it's your safety. It's your safety. Yes. Well, thank you so much for joining us today on this just such a special, meaningful podcast. And I wanted to tell you it's time for something to sip on. Is there anything that you want to tell our guests before we... Something to sip on. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. So if you take nothing else away, you are worthy. You are worthy of living your best life. And that might sound like a really foreign concept to you right now, but you are worthy of living your whole life, your complete life. You are worthy of loving yourself, forgiving yourself and showing yourself grace above and beyond everything else. You are worthy. Amen. That's awesome. I love that. Okay, so it's time for something to sip on. So I ask you three (laughs) questions and just answer them as authentically as you can. Will do. (laughs) So the first question is, what brings you joy? My family and God. The next question is, what are you working on in your life right now? Professionally or personally? Either one. Either one. Professionally, I am working on so many things. I'm currently writing a new book, 365 Ways to Heal Your Family After Domestic Abuse. Super excited. I I created the cover this morning and I'm so close to done. Just ooh, so excited. That brings me joy too. So, and personally, I'm working on just being my complete self. You know, it's an ongoing process. 
the puzzle doesn't ever get completed. And so that'd be cool to me. Yeah. And the last question. What has sure. been your greatest life lesson? I am worthy. That's been my greatest life lesson. That even through the crud that I've been through, I am worthy. Yeah. That's awesome. I love that. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. And so friends, I hope today's episode was food for your soul and fuel for your life. You can go to anywhere you're listening to this podcast and find out more on our guests. Please rate, share, subscribe to this podcast on any platform. I am your host, KK Smith. And remember, you can always celebrate wins and get back up again inside the Mom Stuff Coffee Shop. Mm-hmm.